Hi, my name's Ann Van Hine, and I'm going to share with you not only my story of September 11th, but the facts of that day. Um, as some of you may know, September 11th, 2001 was a Tuesday. It was a beautiful day in the um, Metro New York area. And um, it was primary election day. So many people would not be at their offices at the World Trade Center as everything started to happen because they had gone to vote. It was also the first day of school. And so, um, Many moms or dads had taken their children to school, so they were, were not at the World Trade Center either. But at a little before eight o'clock, American Airlines Flight 11 would leave Boston Logan Airport, which that's north of uh, New York City in Massachusetts, and um, that plane would be hijacked. And the terrorists would, um, break into the cockpit um, and take over the plane. And they would at 8.46 a.m. crash that plane into Tower One of the World Trade Center site. And um, needless to say, there was confusion and everything. You know, we don't usually have passenger jetliners crashing into um, buildings. Um, the news reporters at first were saying it was a small plane because, you know, we couldn't believe it would have intentionally been flown into the building. And then 17 minutes later, another plane, United Flight 175, out of Boston Logan Airport, was flown into Building 1 of the World Trade Center. I'm sorry, building two, the South Tower. And um, at that moment, everyone kind of realized we were under attack, not knowing who we were being attacked by, what was happening. There was um, the rescue um, started immediately, people helping people, firefighters, police officers, all there. And then, um, another flight would crash into the Pentagon, which is right outside of Washington, D.C., right across the river. And then United Flight 93 would crash in um, Shanksville, Pennsylvania. So there were four planes that day, two at the World Trade Center, one in Washington, D.C., and one in Pennsylvania. Now, if you're doing it as a timeline, after the second tower is hit, the Pentagon is then hit, and then building two collapses straight down, just like a pancake. It just goes straight down. It collapsed in um, 10 to 12 seconds. That would register as an earthquake on the Richter scale. The winds would be um, hurricane force, and people that were there talk about it being so dark that if you close your eyes and put your hand over your eyes, it was even darker than that. And then if we're doing timeline, after the second tower collapses, tower two collapses, um, the plane is flown into the ground in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. And that was those passengers through air phone calls and cell phone calls, realizing their plane would be used as a weapon and trying to take it back. And then 102 minutes after being hit, Tower One or the North Tower um, would collapse straight down, same way as the uh, South Tower had. And um, they would pull no one out alive um, after um, Wednesday at 12 o'clock. So you had these two buildings that were 110 stories tall, each about a quarter mile into the sky. At the time, they were the tallest buildings in the Western Hemisphere, first and second tallest buildings in the Western Hemisphere. Um, and they were reduced to a debris pile about 12 stories high. 
course, you had the rescue and then you had the recovery and the recovery went on until the end of May of 2002 when they pulled the last piece of steel out. 2,753 people were killed at the World Trade Center that day. You had 40 people killed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. And the number just went out of my head is how many people were killed at the Pentagon. I apologize for that. I usually know that number, but kind of disappeared. Um, I started doing tours with the 9-11 Tribute Museum in um, March of 2006. Um, they needed people, they were looking to do walking tours around the site so that people could um, tell their stories. So the stories of those killed that day, those who had been in the buildings and survived, those who'd been uh, recovery workers or rescue workers, or those who just simply volunteered to help afterwards, that those stories would be told. And um, because I have a personal connection to the story, um, I decided to start and volunteer. And so from March of 2006 until March of this year, 2020, when COVID hit and uh, we had to be closed for a while, um, I did tours for the 9-11 uh, Tribute Museum and spoke to school groups. And um, I apologize for being a little rusty because I haven't done a school group since March of this year. But um, my personal story is that um, I am the wife, the widow of a New York City um, firefighter. My husband, um, Bruce, was a firefighter. He was in Squad 41, which is part of Special Operations Command. He was in um, Squad 41, is located in the Bronx. If you know anything about the Bronx, um, there is a baseball stadium there, Yankee Stadium, and his firehouse was very near Yankee Stadium. And actually, the last time I saw my husband was Sunday, September 9th. He was on duty Sunday night till Monday night, and then he was going to do a makeup tour on Tuesday, September 11th. Firefighters, their tours are scheduled out. They do so many day tours and then so many, and have X number of days off. And then they do night tours and have so many days off. But what uh, firefighters usually do is they have what's called a mutual partner. They have somebody that's working the other shift within a 24 hour period. So what they do is they try to um, get a person that they could work 24 hours on. And so that's what Bruce was doing Monday, Sunday night till Monday night. He was working 24 hours and then um, he would be off duty for 12 hours and then back on duty. And so since um, it was about, well, it was 50 miles, usually 50, 60 miles from the firehouse to our home, we decided that Monday night he would uh, spend the night at the firehouse because it just really made no sense to drive home to sleep. Um, so as I said, the last time I saw him was Sunday, September 9th. And um, I remember the conversation we had um, very vividly. The funny thing is he did call Monday night, but I don't remember anything about that conversation. But before he was leaving on um, Sunday, he said to me, um, I'm so blessed. And I said, why? And he said, because I'm married to Miss Ann, which is what um, all my students called me. At the time, I owned a dancing school, taught little girls ballet, and they all called me Miss Ann. So when he said he was blessed for being married to Miss Ann, I told him some people wouldn't see that as a perk. And then he said, we have two great daughters, and I agreed with him. My daughters at the time were 14 and 17. And he said, we've had a great summer. And um, I agreed with him on that too, we really had. And he went off to work. 
And on Tuesday morning, um, I drove my daughters to school. Tuesday was actually supposed to be a day that I could do anything I wanted um, because I hadn't started back to teaching yet at my studio. And my daughters were at school and my husband was at work. And so um, I could do whatever I wanted. Um, and so I dropped the kids, the girls off at school. I stopped by my dancing school to check some messages. There weren't any. I got in the car to drive home and I heard on the radio that a plane had hit the World Trade Center. And then within moments later, I heard another plane had hit the World Trade Center. And um, people have asked me why didn't I drive and pick my kids up at school instead of driving home. Um, and I think I thought if my kids were at school and I was at home and Bruce was on duty, it was all normal, right? It was just an average day. So that's kind of a, a, the idea I went under. You know, I'm just, let's try to keep this normal. Um, as I drove home, I heard the fire department issue a total recall, which means for all firefighters um, to report for duty. And that to me was just a signal that this is really, really bad. Um, when I got home, I would see the towers collapse um, on the television. I'd watch the images for a while. I basically, then I just turned it off because there wasn't really any real news. I tried to make phone calls. Um, at that time, most people had landlines and I couldn't, I couldn't make a phone call. Um, it, the, it wouldn't go through. They just said, all oh, circuits are busy. Please try again later. And then I, um, and my cell phone wasn't working either. Eventually my phone did ring and it was my daughter, Emily, calling from school to just say, um, where was daddy? And I said, well, daddy's on duty. You know, he doesn't usually call us when he's on duty. We'll wait and later at the time that he'd be off duty, we'll call and see um, what's happening if we haven't heard from him. And then I told her that I would pick her and her sister up um, at early release time. Um, Emily was a senior at the time and she was getting out of school a little early each day because she didn't have as many classes. So eventually I went back and picked my girls up at school. And um, as we drove home, um, their school to our home was about 26 miles. They went to a small Christian high school. and. Um, you, had to, you actually had to go over the river and through the woods to get there over a mountain. Um, and as we drove home, you could see the New York skyline in the distance and see the smoke. Um, they watched one time, we put the TV on, and they watched everything that had happened and then we turned the TV off and just tried to do normal things. And then about seven o'clock, I called the firehouse, um, Bruce's firehouse, Squad 41, and um, the answering machine picked up and I left a message that said, please tell Bruce Van Hine to call his wife. And then about 15 minutes later, I called back and I said, I got the answer machine again. And I said, uh, please have anyone call Bruce Van Hines' wife. And then I called my parents who I had talked to earlier in the day. And I asked my, um, well, my dad said, just keep calling the, um, the fire department until you get a live person. And so I found the list of phone numbers we had for the fire department. And I uh, called, I didn't realize what I called was the Bronx dispatch, which that's who you call to report a fire. But that firefighter just said, you know, he explained to me who I called and said it wasn't the right number to be calling. Um, but that to just keep calling squad 41 and he was sure, was, you know, sooner or later somebody would pick up. So 
I called squad 41 again, and this time somebody did answer. And the person said it was, you know, it was obviously a firefighter. It wasn't his usual firehouse. And he just said, they've gone to look for them. Um, they'll be back soon. I'll tell them to call you. So at that point, there really wasn't much um, I could do. We had made a house rule that if um, once Bruce got on the fire department, that if anybody heard of a fire, like on their radio or TV, that they couldn't call to ask me if Bruce was on duty. Now, like we were just thinking your basic fire, like, you know, the idea that a September 11th event would happen that a quarter of the world would watch in real time was not what we were thinking about at that point. So actually my very best friends were not calling to see how we were because they knew the house rule. And, and, I, and I was thankful for that. So I didn't have to keep saying, no, I don't know anything. I did, you know, obviously I reached out to some of those people and um, because, you know, our friends help us a lot through things like that. Um, about midnight, um, well, let me go back a little. About 10 o'clock, um, I told my kids, you know, it was time for them to go to bed. And I actually didn't um, put my pajamas on because I just had a feeling somebody would be coming to the house and I didn't wanna um, be in my pajamas. So I, um, I did get in bed with them. They decided they wanted to uh, sleep in my bed. And uh, so we all got into the one bed. And um, like I said, I didn't put my pajamas on and um, I waited till they fell asleep and then I got back up. And I, um, I just, I made a cup of tea. That's what we always did in my house growing up because my mom's uh, British. And um, I just sat on the couch kind of waiting. I didn't know what I was waiting for, but I was just waiting. I didn't, I didn't put the television on. And um, about midnight, I heard two car doors close. And um, I didn't look out the window to see who it was because I didn't want to know. And then there was a knock on my uh, side kitchen door. And I thought, well, this is somebody who's been to our house before because they knew we didn't use the front door to come in and out of the house. We used the side kitchen door. And it was, um, Charlie Brewster's lieutenant and a friend and another firefighter. And um, the weird thing is in my mind, it changes who that firefighter is. Sometimes I think it's one guy, sometimes I think it's another guy. So I don't, I don't really know who it was. Um, but Charlie kind of hemmed and hawed. And then I said to him, Charlie, just say it, just, just say it. And he said, they're unaccounted for. And I said, how many and he said six so all six firefighters who were on duty that day were unaccounted for and i remember saying to charlie i have no doubt that god can get me through this but i don't want to go through this and the minute i said i don't want to um I thought in my head how many times I had said that or heard that actually from my daughters, you know, I don't want to do my homework. I don't want to do this or that, or even the students I taught, you know, I don't want to put tights on. I don't want to this or that. And my response to that statement, I don't want to, was always most of life has nothing to do with what we want to do. And when I thought that, I was just like, it wasn't a sense of dread or anything. It was just a sense that this is happening. And not that I even knew what this was, but this idea that Bruce is unaccounted for, and what does that even mean, was happening. Like I was part of this. Um, my sister, well, my daughters, um, I would go check on them after Charlie left and uh, they would actually be awake. 
and uh, I would tell them that their daddy was unaccounted for. And um, needless to say, we would cry and then we prayed and then we hugged. Um, our faith is very important to us and that was the strength I needed to um, depend on. And then um, the girls went back to bed, but I, um, I stayed up all night actually. And um, it was weird because at one point in the night, as I stayed up because I wanted to see the sunrise, I wanted to know there was another day. Um, I could hear planes and that was so weird because I knew all the planes had been grounded. So I wasn't quite sure how I could hear planes. But then when I talked to a friend the next day, um, she said that there had been fighter jets flying. So that's what I'd actually heard. Um, but really the next few days were um, people showing up to bring us food and people showing up to say, what could they do to help? And the phone ringing and um, us just trying to figure out what were we supposed to do next? Like, I know some people um, went down to the site, but I knew there was nothing I could do to help down there. Um, and so, um, and as a firefighter's wife, I knew that the fire department was looking for Bruce, so I didn't have the sense that I had to. Um, I know many families, um, especially civilian families, had to, you know, they stood on street corners with pictures, or they had pictures of their loved one printed that were posted all over the city or shown on television or whatever. And those pictures at first weren't to say, please remember my loved one. They were to say, have you seen my loved one? You know, um, as the wife of a firefighter, I had the fire department trying to find him. Um, you know, civilians didn't necessarily have that. Needless to say, at the site, the firefighter and policemen and everyone were searching for other people. But as far as getting information, they didn't have the same support system that I had. Um, and I am ever grateful for that support system that I had. Um, by Sunday, um, it was getting a little crazy because there were a lot of people stopping by the house uh, everybody was bringing food which was just really really nice but you were but I was kind of telling this story over and over and over of what we knew which was nothing we didn't really know anything we just knew he was unaccounted for and then at that point my pastor said um that we were circling the wagons which may be an expression you've heard which means you know you're bringing the everybody in close together um to kind of protect what's in the middle and um so basically we had a list of people who if they called i would speak to them um and not to be mean or anything but you have to um start and protect your mental health and how much you know the stress of all of it um, and then if you fast forward, um, a few days, the fire department would have a meeting on September 18th. And that meeting, um, would be the first time I went into Manhattan since the attacks. And, um, when I got up to the George Washington bridge, if my friend Carol, her husband drove myself and my sister, my one daughter in, um, there were military people standing there in full military garb um and unfortunately that's not that unusual um in today's world but back in 2001 you didn't see that as much there wasn't the security at airports like they are now and there wasn't that kind of security on our bridges and stuff so that was um really unnerving um and at that meeting, um, the fire department would tell us that the mission, 
was going from rescue to recovery, which meant that they really did not um, expect to find um, anyone else alive. And so um, after that, a couple of days after that, I asked my daughters, where do you think daddy is um, right now? And they said, um, heaven. I said, well, if daddy's in heaven, then we need to um, have a memorial service. And so uh, we planned that memorial service for um, Saturday, September 9th, 2001. And uh, that memorial service celebrated um, Bruce's life and uh, brought glory to our God. Both of those things were important to us. And then after that, my daughters and I tried to um, establish what we call our new normal, which meant they went back to school. And I have to say, they really did not miss a lot of school um, because they wanted to be there. They wanted to be with their friends. And on October 1st, I went back to um, teaching little girls ballet. And then in March of 2002, we would have a phone call that um, they had found Bruce's body and asking me if I wanted to go there to see his body be um, carried out. And um, I said, no, because there are some images I cannot have in my head. Um, I knew that his body would be treated with the utmost respect as all body and body parts were. And Bruce's body was carried out by um, firefighters from Squad 41 and covered with an American flag, which I um, have that American flag. And um, when I started volunteering with Tribute, I learned a lot about the history of the buildings and everything. So any, so in the future, when you come to visit us, we can teach you all of that. Um, but I also learned other people's stories. And, um, and that's been really important for me. And I think it's important for all of us because now I have friends who were survivors. They were in those buildings that day and they, they just saw things nobody is supposed to see or they were in the surrounding area and saw things nobody's ever supposed to see. And I have um, friends who they lost a loved one, but their loved one was someone that worked in the buildings, you know, and that's kind of a different story. Um, and then, of course, there were people that lived in the neighborhood and the, um, the first responders, whether um, Port Authority police or NYPD or fire department. Um, the fire department lost 343 firefighters that day. The police department lost 23 police officers. And the Port Authority police, um, because that site was under the management of the Port Authority, their police department lost 37 people. There was also one FBI agent lost that day and one um, Secret Service agent and four court reporters. So if you were to come to Tribute and we ventured up to the memorial, you would see that on um, the South Pool, which is where Building 2 had been, along the West Side and the South Side is the name of all first responders lost. And then you would have the people who were on the plane that crashed into that building and the people who were killed at the Pentagon in Shanksville and the 595 people in that building that were killed. And then at the North Pool, where Building 1 had been, you have all the people killed um, in the North Tower. More people were killed in the North Tower because of the point of impact where it hit, the plane hit. And then you have the people that were killed in the 1993 bombing because September 11, 2001 was not the first time that those buildings were attacked. In 1993, terrorists would drive a van into a parking, the parking garage underneath the Trade Center 
and they would detonate that bomb and it would kill um, six people, including a pregnant woman. Now, after those attacks in 1993, they would build a beautiful memorial to those people, but that memorial would be destroyed in the uh, September 11, 2001 attacks. The, the thing that I've really learned from um, volunteering with Tribute, besides all the different facts and everything, is um, how, how important it is to, um, to listen to other people's stories, to learn their stories. You know, I have many friends now who um, we wouldn't have known each other if September 11th hadn't happened and if we hadn't taken the second step of volunteering with the 9-11 Tribute Museum. And um, many of them never met Bruce, but they um, know his story and uh, they do life with me. And that's, that's really, really a gift. So I encourage you um, in your own life, if there's opportunities for volunteering, you know, to do that. I, I uh, once a year talk, speak at a, a school at their career day. And what I speak about is actually uh, volunteerism and how that can add so much to your life. And for young people in particular, students, you know, it might help you find that thing that you wanna, you wanna do. Plus it, all, it also looks really good on your, um, on your applications for college and stuff like that. So, but besides all that, volunteering has just been um, an amazing experience for me and really enriched my life. One of my fellow docents said that we get more from those we share our stories with than what they get from us. And I think that is so true. You know, after September 11th, um, I received hundreds of cards in the mail um, from people who only had my family name from the newspaper. They got they addressed the envelopes to the family of firefighter Van Hine. And they knew the town, which was Greenwood Lake at the time, and they knew the state, New York. They didn't even have a zip code. And they sent cards that said, uh, we prayed for you, or my five-year-old drew a picture for you, or grandma made you this bookmark, or we, my teenager beaded a bracelet. And I can tell you that every one of those cards um, made a difference in my life. And those were intentional acts of kindness. And besides um, thinking about how you can volunteer to help your community or your school or your church or synagogue or mosque, also think about intentional acts of kindness, um, especially in the world that we live in today where we've got all this COVID stuff going on. Just doing something intentionally kind for someone will really go a long, long way. So when um, all this COVID stuff is over, please plan on coming to New York and visiting us because um, myself or any one of our other um, tribute docents would love to um, give you a tour. So be well, take care, and hopefully we'll see you one day. Bye.